Okay, welcome back. This is chapter three. If you remember how the book is laid out, the, the first six chapters are essentially following the OSI model to some extent. So <clears throat> this previous chapter was about the physical layer, you know, the, the how do I put a signal on a wire? Because you remember, you can't put data on a wire. Remember that? Okay, good. So <clears throat> let's just jump into what the learning objectives are for this particular chapter. You're supposed to know the functions of the data link layer. That's pretty easy. An overview of Ethernet. And Ethernet is a, a, a very good uh, uh, example for this uh, just because uh, it's a, a good implementation of layer two. Error detection using cyclic redundancy, Ethernet frame structure, the MAC address, and how they're organized, and then switching. Okay, <clears throat> so just as a bit of review, um, so layer one is all about the electrical signals. Uh, okay, obviously they're not electrical on, on, on fiber optics, but bear with me. So <clears throat> electrical impulses, and remember that you can't put data on a wire. So layer two, the one that's in this chapter, is all about how to configure the data and structure the data so that when it gets put into signals, and comes out it's in some format that somebody else can see so it's all about like formatting I'm formatting the data prior to it being submitted okay um, it, in the beginning they talk about on page 83 they talk about the data link has two major functions one is addressing because it kind of makes sense if in the analogy of the post office, I want to send a letter to grandma. I'm going to have grandma's to address and we're going to have my from address on the envelope. And so that's one of the things that has to happen here is uh, I have my, my frame that I'm getting ready to send over my physical link has to have a to and a from. The other thing it does is error detection. So um, right off the bat, did I say error correction? I said error detection. So what happens if I detect a problem? I detect that the the frame is somehow damaged. Uh, what do I do? Well, in this scenario, you do nothing. You just throw the frame away. Now, I know that sounds a little weird. And um, later on, we're going to get to another chapter where we talk about reliable delivery. But that's not part of <clears throat> layer two. Layer two is not about reliable delivery. It's about how to format data in such a way that I can retrieve it at the other end. That's all it's about. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at this little diagram. This is the same little diagram we talked about before. If I want to send a, uh, an Ethernet frame, so I have Ethernet cable between my home computer and my router. It's a, it's a 100 base T cable. Great. So I'm sending an Ethernet frame across here. And then perhaps this is a coaxial cable. And this, these are optical cables. And this is a point-to-point -point protocol. So the point of all this is my Ethernet segment is only just this tiny little piece right here or perhaps this tiny little piece right here. And it switches hands between different type of cabling technologies as we go through. And every time I swap a cabling technology, I'm probably going to change that layer two to kind of sort of match it. Uh, I don't necessarily have Ethernet on top of fiber optic. Not necessarily. That's not the way it's done. It, Ethernet, it, layer two happens to, to, it looks at layer one and says, oh, are you a member of the Ethernet family? Why, yes, I am. Good, we're going to use Ethernet. And if the answer is, no, I'm a point to point, then, and it's going to say, oh, well, in that case, you're going to get something slightly different. Okay. So on page 85, once again, Ethernet is an excellent implementation of layer two. So we're going to use it as the primary example throughout the rest of the book, and particularly in this chapter. Now, originally, Ethernet was designed for just a local area network only. That's it. It was not designed to be connecting the entire planet together, and therefore it does not connect the entire planet together, just like in this example. Uh, the only Ethernet that exists in this diagram is between my machine and my router and the web server and the campus backbone. That's it. All the rest could be other technologies. All right. So the other one is the 
in addition to the fact that it was really designed for just a single LAN, it also uses the CSMA, you remember all that? Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Detection. Okay, we'll go over all that in just a moment. So again, from a historical perspective, let's, let's continue on that way of thinking. So on page 86, they talk about the original coax cable. So the original coax cable was this really weird thing. The original coax cable was this big monstrous cable, about an inch thick. I mean, it was it was thick cable. And uh, you actually, when you wanted to, to make a connection to the cable, you didn't break the cable and put a fitting in. You actually physically tapped it. And it they call these things vampire taps because they had these little sharp things and you would put uh, this thing on there and just and like use this little tool and and drive it into the cable and it would connect with the the center and connect with the outside and that's how you tapped into an ethernet cable it was kind of spooky and a little scary whenever you tried to put one of these things together so you had a cable that ran down the down the hall, maybe up in the ceiling or something, and then you had these little taps that were connected, and then you had what's called an AUI cable that connected, dropped down from the ceiling. In fact, that's why they were called drops. You've heard about Ethernet drop or network drop, because in the old days, you had a cable that ran the ceiling, and you dropped the cable down and plugged it into the back. Okay. Anyway, the point of the story is that uh, this was a, a bus configuration. In other words, all of the data happened on a single bus and everyone heard everyone else's transmission. There's no privacy in a bus technology, okay? Think that thing through because that's going to be a, an important concept. Any piece of data being transmitted by this machine is also going to be able to be read by any other machine because it's not directed to anyone. It's just thrown on this giant bus. Because this was a local area only, there was no routing of any data to anywhere and there was no way you could direct traffic to a particular machine. In other words, if I wanted, I'm sorry, that's not exactly true. I could direct the traffic to a machine, but I couldn't prevent other machines from hearing it. And the other problem with a bus technology is anytime there was a break anywhere, anywhere in the cable, doesn't matter if it was at the end, if I had a break in the cable, the whole thing just came crashing down. So that was kind of a bad idea. This whole bus concept was incredibly simple, kind of cheap to put together, but whew, it was not fun. Okay, the alternate is what's called a hub topology. And so a hub is some sort of a device, and you have individual cables going to individual machines. Now, this kind of sort of looks like a star configuration, doesn't it? Where you have like a central hub, and then you have machines coming off of it. That's what it physically looks like, but just looking at the picture, that is not what this is. Uh, we'll go into some more details between why this only has the appearance of a star, but it is not. It's just the same as before, in that data sent to this machine over here is also being able to be read by any of the other machines. Okay, kind of makes sense. Okay. Okay, so the first part of the two, two things that we're supposed to do here is addressing. So let's talk about addressing. So if everyone can hear me talk in this kind of a bus scenario, how do I talk to just one person? Well, you do that with, with a header. So my data, remember this is all about formatting the data. So my data basically has an envelope and the envelope contains a to address. It also has a from address, but bear with me. Okay, so everyone can hear the thing. They can't just necessarily, uh, but they could ignore it. So here we are. So here's PCA, and I want to talk to PCB. So I put an envelope with B's address. Now here's my data. So it gets sent along the wire, and it goes in both directions simultaneously. So the network printer sees it, the file server sees it, the wireless act point, and, the, and therefore the laptops, they all see that. The only difference is 
These guys have been told to ignore all mail that doesn't belong to them. It's no different than you going to the mailbox, opening the door, pulling out a, a, a letter and go, well, that's not mine, and just putting it back in the box and going back inside. It's If it's not addressed to you, you just ignore it. That's how it worked. Okay. <clears throat> so what if I wanted everyone to pay attention? Sort of like a lecture. Uh, you have one PC at, at, at the lectern that's broadcasting to all, and I don't necessarily want to talk to everyone. So how in the world could I do a, a broadcast of a single message that more than one uh, person could hear? And just to make things less complicated, let's assume that I want to send it to every machine or every student looking at that. Well, there is a special type of address uh, that is the all address. And so I just code this thing with an extra little doodad. And uh, then when I send it on the wire, everyone will get it. So let me, let me rephrase the rules. PC number B over here is going to pay attention to A, all of the packets directly sent to it by its address, or B, the special broadcast address. It'll listen to both its own address and the special broadcast address. Anything else is ignored. Okay, kind of makes sense. Let's continue. Okay, so on page 91, they go into a little bit more detail talking about the carrier sense, multiple access, collision detection. Let's just go through them one more time. So what is carrier sense? Carrier sense basically means, uh, let me see if you see anybody on the line before I dial. Okay, it's like, is it quiet? And if it's, and this is no different than, uh, okay, going back to the classroom environment, you wait till, the, till there's a break in the conversation before you, you know, raise your hand or blurt out something. Same thing here, you just wait for silence and then you start to talk. That's what carrier sense is. Multiple access, that's fairly obvious that you could have multiple conversations going on at the same time. Collision detection is how do I determine whether or not uh, I've accidentally talked on top of somebody else. Okay, now collision detection, if I start to talk and you start to talk at the same time, wham, I'm, I'm going to be able to detect that I talked over you and you're going to be able to de detect that you talked over me. So we're both going to stop in the middle. I mean, I could have sent maybe 12 bytes and maybe you sent 30 bytes. But as soon as we figured out that, there, that oops, we're, we're both talking at the same time, both of us stop dead in our tracks. And then we wait a couple, a random amount of time. And then we start up again. Now think about this. The idea is this, there should be a random back off time. And why does it have to be random? Well, because if the Ethernet standard said, you know, wait two and a half microseconds before you try again, well then, we would try to talk, we'd go oops, and then we would try to talk again, it would go oops, and we'd try to talk again, and it'd go oops, that's, that's not gonna work. So that random back off was designed so that one of them starts, and then the other one goes, oh well, I guess I'll wait. And wait shows to be clear, and then boop, comes back again. So the random back off is, is kind of important. And if there's some sort of weirdness going on, like we both start to talk at the same time, wham, and then there's a random back off, and then we did it again, and it was another, the machines are designed so that the random back off can gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger. Again, to prevent the issue of always being in synchronization talking. Okay, all is not war great in the CSMA CD world. So on page 94, they talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Okay. Um, actually, this is probably a good place to stop for the 15-minute mark, and uh, we'll pick up this discussion in just a few.